Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, good afternoon. Hi, my name is uh, Kentaro Toyama. I'm the Assistant Director of Microsoft Research India. Uh, and it is my great pleasure today to introduce uh, Dr. Paul Polak. Uh, Paul and I have known each other for about a year and a half. We were introduced by a uh, mutual friend at the Gates Foundation. And um, uh, soon after we were introduced, Paul sent me a, a draft of the book that is now being uh, sold in the back there. And I remember thinking when I first read it that the things that he was saying were exactly the same things that we were finding were necessary in order to do good uh, development of uh, research for uh, developing countries as being Microsoft. And so uh, Paul and I immediately headed off, um, and we've been in uh, touch ever since. Uh, I also want to thank, where's Michael? Michael Aldridge from the uh, Unlimited Potential Group, who was, uh, whose suggestion it was actually to get Paul to come here and uh, speak in the series. Anyway, uh, Paul is a psychiatrist by training, but for the last 25, 30 years, he has been focused on uh, development, particularly in agriculture, and his, uh, he's very much aligned with what Bill Gates calls creative capitalism. He believes that business is the way to go for development, and uh, hopefully he'll tell us a little bit about the kinds of inventions that he's been working on, uh, as well as what's in the future. Thanks. So I really prefer to uh, interact uh, during, before, uh, afterwards, or instead of. Uh, so, uh, to start with, is there anything in, in particular any of you uh, are interested in that you want me to talk about? Or is this a shy group? Huh? What? Why did I focus on the poor? Poverty of thinking. On my part. Uh, <laughs> Well, uh, because it's the most challenging problem I could find. I, uh, I, I, I'm, I, I love to satisfy my curiosity. And if you give me a problem that is impossible to solve, that's the most fun for me. Uh, I worked as a psychiatrist for 22 years, started uh, realizing that chronically mentally ill people uh, their poverty is more important to deal with than their mental illness because that was much more effective in uh, their adjustment when we started w providing opportunities for employment, uh, self-esteem, housing. That had a profound impact. So that got me going. But uh, in terms of my own self, economic self-interest, working as a psychiatrist, I'm a serial entrepreneur. That's, uh, that's not the Raisin Bran kind, but um, I sort of, uh, uh, I, I did several businesses while I was working as a psychiatrist, made enough money to be financially self-sufficient. Uh, and I got, I became curious about the poor people we were working with uh, were after all living on 500 bucks a month, which is very wealthy on a world scale. So I, got, I, I went to Bangladesh to talk some, to some people uh, who were earning uh, 30 bucks a month. And talking to you, you said in reading the book, the most important thing she, uh, in the book for you is that I talk to people and listen to what they say, which is about all there is to everything. And so when I started talking to poor people and listened to what they had to say, they said that, they were farmers, they, they were poor because they didn't have enough money, they needed some water control. I found a, about a treadle pump, so I uh, started to make that available and one thing led to another and that ended up with 25 years. So there's a long-winded answer to the question, but in the end, do you know why you, you're doing what you're doing? <laughs> well, I guess I would say the same thing, except I've had more fun with this than anything I've done in my life, and that's why I'm doing it. And the fact that it helps poor people is a, is a very uh, a good side effect. 
but I think my primary motivation, as far as I can understand anything about my motivation, is I have a hell of a lot of fun and it brings me a lot of peace. Yes, sir? Did you focus on trying to help people first or create a business first? Well, if you look at, uh, like what I say in the book, my first business was uh, I uh, grew seven acres of strawberries when I was 15. So I suppose that was a business first. And I did that because I, I, I found out that I could, you got five cents a quart for picking strawberries. I picked 200 quarts, that made 10 bucks, and I thought that was a lot of money in those days. Uh, but if I could make 10 bucks a day picking strawberries, think what the owner of the strawberry patch could make. So I conned a couple of local farmers into giving, letting me use their land and their horse. And I decided to go into the strawberry business. But seven acres of strawberries supplies about 100,000 people with strawberries. So that was my first business. I've always had businesses. Now, uh, like uh, I've got a a 75-acre wild blueberry farm in Nova Scotia as a sideline while I'm doing all this stuff. So I, I just, uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, I can't help myself. But in the case of the travel pump, yeah. you go into it going, I want to create a business no. that actually addresses the market of, of the impoverished? Or did I no, I had no clue. Well, that's not entirely true. Uh, there were a bunch of us that were interested in this, and it was a group of Mennonites. Uh, and it became clear, all of us had the feeling that the forces of the marketplace were very important in poverty. So we from the beginning wanted to, uh, to uh, harness market forces. And uh, so we were looking at those kind of models and from the very beginning that's what we did. First project uh, we did was in the refugee camps in Somalia in 1981. We helped refugee blacksmiths build and sell 500 donkey carts. Donkey cart was 450 bucks and it earned 200 bucks a month net. And uh, we said to UNHCR that we wanted to not give these away, we wanted to make them available uh, on loans. And that was a radical idea. They fought us tooth and nail. We finally got it through. We repossessed two donkey carts. Uh, when people realized they could make 200 bucks a month, we never had an another loan default. And that ended up right out of the chute being the most successful income generating project in Somalia. Um, and that was a tough place to work. That was a great place to learn the ropes because it was crooked and, yes sir? Why would you choose to sell to, to sell them instead of just hand them out? What was the motivation? Was it to profit or was there other motivations? Can you repeat the question, please? Uh, why did we choose to sell it rather than hand it out? Uh, instead of giving you a smart-ass answer, I'll try to answer it straight for a change. Uh, handing it out doesn't work, pure and simple. Um, best example of that is in the old Soviet Union, where there's a big scarcity thing, uh, you could get bread for nothing, practically nothing, but you had to wait in line six hours to get it. And what happened is that bread was so cheap that when they did get it, farmers fed it to their pigs, which created a bigger shortage of bread. Uh, the whole trend of giving things away it permeates the field of development and I think it's a disaster. Jeff Sachs uh, believes that r r really poor people don't have enough money to buy the things they need so you need to provide, basically donate, uh, the key things that a poor village needs. And then once uh, a village has roads and health care and irrigation and agriculture, the market will take off. Uh, I, I'm convinced that that won't work. And there are a thousand cases where it hasn't worked in the past. What's your feeling about that? My feeling is that if you give something away, then it has exactly the value that you assign to it. Um, okay. More or less. So. There will be some standouts who will take the donkey cards and use them to go make money, but they won't. 
they won't have any kind of a drive because they're not invested in it whatsoever. I've seen that. I, I lived a, quite a while on a reservation. And I, I saw people moving into free homes and then turning them into motocross tracks and whatever, whatever. Uh, very, very similar thing. Did yeah. The house don't no, really care. Yeah, that's pretty much uh, my experience too. So that's that's why we do it that way. Now, by the way, I uh, I, I do want to present some stuff, so I won't be uh, just answering questions. But I but I like doing this because uh, no, you've already had a turn. This guy had a question. I'll come I'll come back to you. Dr. Bonnet, you mentioned uh, corrupt officials. In your experience, in thirty years, have you generally found uh, the bureaucracy to be a hindrance, or have you also found motivated, passionate officials who have been helpful and, uh, and government has helped with those to get in the way? He's asking, uh, with corrupt corruption in the past 30 years, have I found government officials to be helpful, or uh, uh, are they mostly getting in the way? Sir, are you referring to here in the United States or elsewhere? No, sir. I'm being smart. Don't take me seriously. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> Um, one of the organizations that I just started is a is a 501c3. Anybody who's gone through a 501c3 uh, process knows that it's uh, it's long, tedious, uh, and tends to be bureaucratic. Uh, it's often even worse in developing countries. Um, that's just a uh, that's just a reality. The first project, the donkey cart project, uh, it took in Somalia in the refugee camps. It took an average of one to two years to get a project approved. The process we went through for the donkey cart project is first you had to type it, but the rule was that the proposal had to be typed in the UNHCR offices by their secretaries. The problem was that f for religious reasons they had very long uh, pinky fingernails, which meant that they required electric typewriters, but the electricity was usually off. So the proposal never got typed, so I typed it, and then I got into trouble because I broke the rules in typing it. So then they approved it, and it went to the uh, Ministry for Refugee Affairs, headed by a guy who had a master's degree from M MIT, who's a Somali. And it sat there and sat there, and I uh, went up to him one day and I said, I'm going to sit on your desk every day, every morning, until you review this proposal. And he said, you're kidding. And I said, no, I'm not. He reviewed it in five days. I sat on his desk. Uh, then it went to the Agriculture Ministry of uh, the Refugee Department in, in the Somali government. And there it was truly stuck indefinitely until a volunteer had pity on me and said, look, the reason it will never be reviewed is that the minister is illiterate. So your proposal is too long. Uh, summarize it in one page and I'll read it to him. And I think then he'll uh, pass on it. So I did. He did. He approved it. I took it back to UNHCR and they rejected it because it was too short. <laughs> this is a true story. So I, I don't know if that uh, qualifies as an example of bureaucratic stuff. We got that project approved in three months, which was a world record for Somalia in those, uh, in those days. But that's because I didn't know anything about it and uh, uh, really hustled to get it done. Uh, one more question. Oh, you, you were going uh, a couple of things. Mind me be short. So what is the toughest argument you have to counter about when someone claimed that giving is better than paying for something. I mean, getting is better than paying for something. What's the toughest argument uh, that I had to deal with? Because I know you believe that give, getting something for free is not as good as... Well, I've had 25 years experience. I may be wrong, but... Uh, and my, this is what I say to people. Uh, there is no tough argument. Uh, Jeff Sachs has got a uh, pretty convincing ar set of arguments, and a lot of people like Jeff Sachs. Mm. Poor, poor people are... Too, uh, what's the most convincing argument that I use? No, no. What's the most convincing argument you've heard from your opponents that giving is better? Well, well just what, what Jeff, Jeff Sachs says. These people, if you're living on a dollar a day, there's no way you can afford <laughs> the equipment that you need to move out of poverty. So in the beginning, to get the thing started, you've got to give it away. And you believe that, 
Well, you know what, what I believe. The, the problem is uh, that uh, people don't uh, design things that are cheap enough to be affordable on a buck a day and that uh, to, to make things attractive to poor people as customers, you have to, I have what I call the don't bother trilogy of design for the bottom of the pyramid. If you haven't talked to 25 poor customers first, if it doesn't pay for itself in three months, and if you can't sell a million of them, don't bother. So I don't screw around with anything that doesn't meet those criteria, and there are thousands of things that do. So usually the argument uh, people are too poor is because you've designed something far too expensive, so then you have to subsidize it. You, you, you don't go through the mental discipline. I mean, how many uh, pieces of Microsoft software would you sell if all of them were priced at $20,000. That's in effect what people do when they develop products for poor people. And then they say, well, poor people can't afford $20,000, so we have to give it to them. I, I had a big argument with Netafim, the big, biggest drip irrigation company in the world. They said, our drip equipment is the best in the world and poor people deserve the best. So you join us and uh, we'll uh, get the World Bank to make a big grant and you got some good credibility so you can get the grant uh, and we'll make our top, top notch drip equipment available to poor farmers and we'll use the World Bank to subsidize the cost. I said, no. In the end, I couldn't get anybody, I couldn't get Netafilm interested in an affordable small plot dri uh, uh, drip irrigation system. I couldn't get Jane Irrigation, the biggest company in India, interested in that. So. IDE, the organization that I ran, developed that ourselves, started to make it available in the marketplace. Uh, there's been about 500,000 of them sold now. Uh, Netafem and uh, Jane have to compete with our low-cost drip because a lot of 30-acre banana farmers are using it because uh, the advantages of the more expensive systems don't outweigh the affordability of the systems we're using in a lot of instances. But in some instances, the better the higher quality systems with less, requiring less labor are preferable. So there's one other question and then I want to go ahead with the presentation, yes. Do you believe uh, that poverty can be eliminated in, the, in our lifetime, so next 30, 40 years? How long is our lifetime? Yeah, so Your lifetime or my lifetime? <laughs> so the next 35 years, let's say. Your no, lifetime. my lifetime. My lifetime. But yeah, speculating. I think, I think one half of dollar a day people can move out of poverty in my lifetime, which may be only six months, who knows, because I'm 75. That's my IQ, it's also my age. Uh, no, uh, it can be eliminated very, in a very short period of time if you understand it from poor people's perspective, not from some desk jockey's perspective at the World Bank or in an academic institution or in a research center that has no connection to the customers it serves. And, and uh, this is not just pie in the sky. Um, most, the, 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 Kentaro and I were having an interesting discussion. Uh, people lump all poverty together, $10 a day, $3 a day, $5 a day, $1 a day. That's like saying the people uh, who earn $10,000 a day a, a year here are the same as people who earn $150,000. It's, it's a segmented uh, uh, marketplace. So the biggest problem in poverty is the people who earn less than a dollar a day. Of those people, uh, there are 1.2 billion of them. 800, between 800 and 850 million are very specifically people who make a living on one acre of land in scattered quarter acre plots. It's not a complicated thing to help them increase their income. When you talk to them, they need affordable water control because they're usually growing crops in the rainy season when everybody else is and the price is low. They're usually growing primarily subsistence crops and their main competitive advantage in the marketplace is low-cost labor. So they should, in their self-interest, go to high-value, labor-intensive cash crops, uh, at the same time improving uh, their production of food so they have enough to eat because they're risk-averse. If you do that, I think you can reach 500 million of those. 
IDE, the organization that I started, has reached 17 million. But that's starting from scratch with uh, just me in an office and no other staff. Uh, so, I mean, I think it's totally, uh, uh, poverty is, uh, we've made it far too complicated. It's a very simple kind of thing. And it, it can be uh, dramatically uh, influenced by unleashing marketplace forces. Well, so one of the things I'm going to talk about today, uh, and I better start doing that or we won't present this material, but I enjoy this as much as anything. Uh, and, and we'll keep doing it uh, during the whole presentation. Um, I started IDE as a nonprofit organization, worked there for 25 years. First and most important thing is to listen to poor people and learn from them. So I, uh, from, from the first year I said I would interview $100 a day people every year and I've done that. So I have now uh, interviewed 3,000 of these customers uh, and walked with them through their fields. Uh, so I know a lot about them as a customer group and they've taught me everything that I know. Uh, so if you do that, you can, you can pretty much uh, do anything. Now, what happened is that after 25 years, I thought it was time to move on and have a succession plan. So I, uh, uh, I've handed over IDE to my successor and uh, 10 months ago started two new companies. One is a nonprofit uh, whose mission is to foment the design revolution to reach the other 90%. Because I believe that right now, big business and uh, design, uh, people who design things, and, and I include in that Microsoft, spend pretty much most of their time uh, finding solutions to the problems of the richest 10% of the world's customers. Uh, it's time to reverse that ratio and uh, look at opportunities serving the other 90%. So the second organization that I started is going to be a multinational corporation which will demonstrate that it's possible to make very attractive profits by serving people at the bottom of the pyramid, defined as people, the, the 2.6 billion people in the world who make less than $2 a day. And I'm going to describe a couple of things about how to do that. But that requires a revolution in thinking. Uh, right now, people talk about the digital divide. Kentaro and I were talking about that uh, at lunch. Uh, both of us are convinced that that exists in people's head. The divide is because we're limited in our thinking. Uh, Kentaro said, look, uh, we were talking about a, a thing that we were doing about uh, small dairy farmers. People don't talk about a cow divide, and yet a cow really uh, that, that gives a fair amount of milk uh, is uh, affordable only for the most part in, in Africa by people who are in three to ten bucks a day. Is that a cow divide? It's not a cow divide. You can, you can reach people with the same issues about creating milk and selling it at a profit if you go from cows to dairy goats. It's not a cow divide, it's a thinking divide. It's, it's not a digital divide. You have to dramatically change your thinking and I'll be talking about that a little bit more. So, are we ready to uh, do some presentation? Whoop, I think I've started at the very back. So I need to move this thing. Let's see. I guess this is the best way to do it. People often tell me I'm a contrarian, but I take the opposite view. Um, so in keeping with this, I decided to call my presentation Slow Technology. I, uh, how many of you know about the slow food movement? So this is applying some of the principles of the slow food movement uh, to technology. 
Uh, a guy in Italy objected to setting up a McDonald's in his neighborhood. So he uh, initiated the slow food movement. Uh, it believes that you should enjoy your food and taste it. And uh, that uh, uh, in the world of the future, you should be able to walk to the farm close to your house to buy your stuff and having, uh, instead of having strawberries flown in from Colombia. So it's like that. So, here's my paraphrase of uh, Moore's Law. In the information field, you have to double the number of, number of angels who dance on the head of a pin every two years and uh, make them dance twice as fast or your company dies. And here's the guy that came up with that concept. He seems like a cheerful fellow. <laughs> so my contention is that for the 2.6 billion people who actually represent an exciting virgin untapped marketplace and profit opportunity, slow technology rules. And the idea is to design radically affordable tools and make them available to poor customers in their own village. I came up with what I called every man's prayer, which goes something like this. Lord, give me a tool that is simple and local and slow. Most important of all, God, please make the price low. By the way, this, this is a low-cost drip kit in Nepal. Costs about a quarter the price of a standard drip system. And people earn their money back in three months. So what I want to do now is not spend too much time talking about the past 25 years, but it is what has been the basis of learning for these two new companies. And I want to talk about these two new companies because it's the future. And I think it applies very much to you. So the book talks about 12 steps for practical problem solving. And the first three are all very obvious but rarely practiced. And that is for any social problem, not just poverty, Go to where the action is, talk to the people who have the problem, and actually listen to what they have to say. That listening part is a lot tougher, and people think of listening as words. It's not words. If I walk through a farm, my contention is if you train yourself, you can walk through a village in Nepal or India or, or uh, uh, Rwanda once and write a book because there's a huge amount of information in what you see and how people interact with you, what they're wearing, uh, whether the house has a thatched roof or a corrugated tin roof uh, speaks uh, volumes. Why do you think people don't do one, two, three? It sounds like common sense, right? It's totally common sense. Why do you think they don't do it? Well, there are two reasons I don't know which. One is laziness, the other is arrogance. Well, you can come up with your own reasons, but, I, but it would be truly revolutionary if you introduced Polak's law, which was that every World Bank uh, official had to uh, spend at least a week in a village talking to at least $50 a day people in depth. That would, that, that would be a revolution. And, uh, but uh, you don't have to go very far. Uh, there are lots of businesses here where people don't know their customers and they go down. The businesses that are successful really know their customers, right? It's, it is not rocket science. So these three things are the critical uh, things. And then learning every, learn everything you can about the specific context. 
Take agriculture. There are 525 million farms in the world. How many of them do you think are smaller than five acres, two hectares? Any guess? 510 million. It's pretty close. It's 85%. About one half of cultivated acreage in developing countries is represented by farms that are less than five acres. If you read stuff, if you do a content analysis of the cutting edge in agriculture, how many articles do you think you'll find about how to raise three goats or how to farm effectively on a quarter acre piece of land? The, the agriculture science has far too much been dominated by Western cutting edge technology and in Canada, United States and Europe, farm size is big and getting bigger. In developing countries, pretty much across the board, it's small and getting smaller because of population growth. So it's totally missing uh, a whole agricultural science based on small plots. And yet that's the cent one of the central issues for farming and for poverty and for market opportunities, new market opportunities. Drip irrigation, for instance, is a very efficient way of delivering water, irrigation water, but it covers 1% of world irrigated acreage because it's too expensive and too big. And yet, uh, when I've negotiated with the biggest drip irrigation company in the world, that's Netafilm, and uh, with Jane Irrigation, which is the biggest in India, I could not get them to budge an inch in designing affordable small plot irrigation. But that's the same as going from mom and pop grocery stores to supermarkets or to Walmart only multiply that by a factor of 100. The market for low-cost drip irrigation is huge, but you've got to go to a big volume, lower margins. So I'll whiz through some of these. Here's the other 12 things that I described. Think and act big and think like a child. Those may be in contradiction, but I don't think they are at all. You have to be able to see and do the obvious. And kids are experts in lateral thinking at the age of three or four. And if, if studies of lateral thinking show that something like 85% uh, do it uh, in grades three and four, and maybe 12% the, uh, when they're ready to graduate from high school. We've got to get back to being able to think in those simple terms. Sure. You think there's fundamental things wrong in our education? Yes. <laughs> what are those? <laughs> That's another three hours. No, no, I think that part of the thing is it's part of the socialization process. We take kids that are creative and uh, sort of put them into a civilized mode. And it's a lot better to have them uncivilized, I think, or, or at least something in the education process. I'm not saying that it's all bad, but something that interferes with creativity and thinking out of the box uh, is built into it, and that's a, a tragedy. So some of these things are obvious too. Uh, you always do it. Uh, right now, you, uh, I Google everything. It's easy to check if somebody else has already solved a problem. Uh, that's politically incorrect, but I'm, I'm used to that. Uh, it's easy to find out if somebody else has already got a solution, and you might as well steal that instead of the, uh, inventing your own or, or make use of it. Uh, you've got to design the critical price targets. You've got to know your population and, and know what's affordable to them. And if you don't do that, that's why, uh, that's one of the reasons people don't have any sense very often about what the critical price target is. I talked to a guy who was d inventing, this is 15 years ago, a, a tool system for farmers in Africa. It was a great idea. You, you could, it's a tool carrier and you could put on it an ox cart or a plow, or a harrow, 
I, th I thought it was a great idea, and I asked him, how much will this cost? And he said, well, you know, it's an interesting question. I haven't really thought about that yet. And then I knew that was going to be a disaster, which it was after it spent millions of dollars. Because if you don't design that in a way that makes sense to the customers, it'll, ne it'll, ne it'll never spread. Um, and I already said it's important to think big in terms of uh, impact. If you go to a village, you can right away identify 20 problems. Might as well work on the problem that is applicable to a thousand villages and not just one. Here's a family that I talk about in the book. Krishna Bahadur Tapa and his family were surviving on 50 to 100 bucks a year. He ran across a drip system uh, in Pokhara uh, because his uncle had it. Uh, he had the advantage of having a hose installed by a, uh, uh, a Swiss organization, Helvetos, for drinking water. It delivered a quarter inch full hose 24-7 as drinking water. That's more than what the house needed. He held the hose by hand to uh, water a few winter off-season vegetables, but it wouldn't do very many. The drip system allowed him to take that water and irrigate uh, an eighth of an acre of uh, off-season cauliflower and cucumbers. Uh, it cost 26 bucks. Uh, he earned 250 bucks in the first year because these, in, in the off season, they were worth three times as much. Uh, he never looked back. Uh, when I visited his family uh, six months ago, he had died, by the way, of a heart attack, and I was worried that somehow the wealth caused this, but apparently it didn't. Uh, his family was now living on $4,800 a year. Uh, they had uh, dairy uh, buffalo. They had a, a pond where they were raising fingerlings to sell to other farmers. Uh, they were raising goats. They bought a, a six-tenth of an acre of oranges and were making 500 bucks from that, uh, 600 bucks from dairy. Uh, one of the sons was working in, in the Middle East uh, and sending back 100 bucks a month. Uh, so their net was about... Uh, uh, 4,000 bucks, more than most of the staff of IDE Nepal made. And these things are also uh, uh, quite obvious, uh, including the 12th one, stay positive, don't be distracted by what other people think. A lot of times I come up with a, an obvious idea and people say, if, 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 if that was really needed, the market would have developed it already, but it's not true. So I want to quickly uh, tell you about, where are we on time? We started at 1.30, and so we got... We have like another 40 minutes, five minutes to 60. Yeah, so I'll, I'll present for another 10 or 15 minutes, uh, so we'll have lots of time for questions. So here's an example of more the business model that evolved in the nonprofit organization. We really learned more than anything from the treadle pump. And... Uh, we, we got into this in Bangladesh because Bangladesh, pr virtually 85% of the country uh, is, uh, is non-buildable by Western standards. It's in a flood zone. Um, and usually there are two rainy season crops, mostly rice and uh, various other monsoon crops. Then there's a dry winter season where uh, nobody grows very much. Although because it rains so much, water is in the ground 12 feet below people's feet. So... The solution was at $12, it's like a Stairmaster. Uh, actually, it costs $8 for, for the pump. And then a creative engineer from Norway, Gunnar Barnes, uh, developed this. Uh, he, he said, I need to develop an irrigation device that will cost the same as a sack of rice. So he did. So the retail price for a treadle pump is 8 bucks. You can drill a well that goes down 40 feet to the aquifer, put a two-inch plastic pipe down and a filter on the bottom. And that whole thing installed is 25 bucks. And that's with a manufacturer, the dealer, and the technician that installs the well, each making a profit. That's an unsubsidized price. So uh, that seemed like a very good idea. People would make a lot of money uh, selling vegetables. They could grow a quarter acre of vegetables. So we energized, acting as a nonprofit, a private sector network of 75 manufacturers, these are little workshops, uh, 3,000 village dealers who sold a treadle pump at a 12% at a margin, and we trained three to 4,000 well drillers. 
we gave him a three-day course with a certificate. And that became the private sector system that ended up making treadle pumps available as a business to earn a living. This is your standard factory. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it's very much like the factories where Microsoft produces software. Uh, the worker here is wearing standard OSHA footwear. Uh, it, there are lots of places in these countries in Bangladesh, a little workshop with a welder, two or three thousand bucks investment, they're maybe making bed springs. So these are our manufacturers, 75 of them. This is uh, a typical Alice Chambers uh, dealership. Uh, this is one of our dealers. You see that they uh, sell uh, uh, brooms and various other things, but those are treadle pumps in the front. Which color is the most popular? I think magenta. <laughs> That's like so nice. Huh? And now the critical thing is the real design issue is not the te technology, it's designing the private sector supply chain and the marketing and distribution. Here, uh, uh, 15 or 20 years ago, we're dealing with a customer base. Uh, most of them were illiterate. There was no mass media. So how do you uh, introduce a technology that has the same problem as a politician without name uh, recognition? So the first thing we did is we hired some troubadours. And they composed songs about the treadle pump and they played at village markets. And what you don't, so they're singing a song, uh, it's a little band. Over to the left is a guy on a treadle pump with recirculating water. And over to the right is a guy handing out leaflets saying, if you want a treadle pump, go to Honest Sam's. Do you know any treadle pump songs? No, but I can make one up on the spot. <laughs> no, I've, I've got this on video. I can make it available. You know, it's, it's typical Bangladeshi stuff. Then uh, we produced a 90-minute Bollywood uh, movie. <laughs> and before each showing uh, we uh, in the village, this is a typical village, <clears throat> there's a rickshaw procession. And there's a mic. There's a, see the guy on the treadle pump? And this, is this, this guy, I think, has ruined a lot of uh, hearing uh, with these <laughs> megaphones. And it says, come to the big uh, performance tonight, and, and so on. This is uh, the movie playing in a village setting. And there's no electricity, so we used a generator. Uh, generally, it's an open-air setting. Uh, you get uh, three to 5,000 people that show up. The, the dealers bring their potential customers. And that's an important part of the process. The, the story in the movie is like this. Uh, now, a typical Bollywood Bangladeshi movie has a wedding, a funeral, a near suicide, and a lot of singing and dancing. <laughs> what? Around trees, right? Around what? Dancing and singing around trees. Yeah, trees sometimes, yeah, all, all over the place. We found that we could hire the top director in Bangladesh, the top male lead, the top female lead, for about 25 grand to make a 90 minute movie. The plot was like this, boy meets girl, they want to get married, uh, but her father is very poor, so he doesn't have enough money for the dowry, so he can't uh, uh, come up with a dowry for them to get married. She falls into the clutches of a dowry bandit. Uh, you know, that happens a lot in, the, in those countries. They, they take the dowry and then they either kill the wife or send her packing back home and do it again. Uh, near suicide, grief, singing and dancing, and the... At the, at the biggest suspense moment, the movie stops. The dealers put potential customers up on treadle pumps. Uh, after the intermission, the movie resumes. Can you hold the pumps so you can market <laughs> Yeah, pretty much, yeah. yeah. Well, like, most of you are embarrassed to walk out in the middle of this, so I'm holding you hostage. It's the same thing. Uh, so uh, then the movie continues. The father runs into a, a school friend who tells him about the treadle pump. So he buys a treadle pump, makes a lot of money, uh, has enough money for the dowry, they get married and live happily ever afterwards. Can we get this <laughs> Yeah, sure, sure. It might help you. Uh, are you married? <laughs> I thought of marrying you. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This would help you. This would probably help you. I'll, I'll get you a movie, but it'll cost. <laughs> so this played to an audience of a million people a year. And it really helped popularize the treadle pump. So the, the, the main thing we did as a nonprofit, and it cost about six bucks for a per installed treadle pump, which was a subsidy, but it's a market creation subsidy. Uh, each major actor in the private sector supply chain needs enough volume to make a living. So that takes marketing, and we did this. And by the way, after we pulled out, uh, and we ended up doing treadle pumps in several countries. There's 50,000 treadle pumps a year sold now uh, after we pulled out uh, through the private sector network. Uh, now here's uh, some of the economics. Um, after about 15 years, uh, we had sold, we didn't sell, the private sector system that we energized sold 2.1 million treadle pumps. Uh, poor people who really are too poor to invest in anything invested more than $50 million of their own money. Uh, these are dollar-a-day people in treadle pumps. Yes? How much did you invest? So like, your total number, you said it was six per pump. Uh, I've got those numbers on the next slide. Um, yes? You mentioned the price of the uh, treadle pump was $12 with the total of $2.1 by 12 uh, 25 bucks for the well. You got to... Uh, the, I'm sorry, uh, the $12 was wrong, it's $8. But by the time you drill a well and put the pump on it and put the plastic in, in the, in the, uh, it's, it's 25 bucks. But the average, uh, the average family earned a net income of $100 uh, and 20% of them earned a net income of $500 from that $25 investment. So they earn $210 million a year forever from that and basically uh, uh, IDE, the organization that I started, it's not only treadle pumps but a whole bunch of other things. Uh, 13 different affordable irrigation technologies and then we worked at the other end uh, uh, taking, going into an agroclimatic zone, defining the key crops that could be grown profitably, uh, taking advantage of low-cost labor uh, and uh, uh, access to market so they could sell their profit, the crops at a profit uh, in addition to the uh, seeds and fertilizer, whatever the constraints are. So here's the total numbers. Uh, in 25 years, IDE spent $78 million, some of which uh, came from grants, some from contributions. Poor people invested $139 million, and uh, they increased their annual net income by $288 million uh, forever. And uh, it's a learning curve, so most of these people, once they get going, they keep just like that example of Krishna Bahadur Tapa. Where, where did the training budget come from? The what budget? You trained lots of people, right? You got them certification. That's part of that six buck uh, subsidy. So that's part of the 78 million you invested? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, I mean, IDE ended up uh, operating through local staff. So in Bangladesh, we had about 100 full-time staff that were pretty much all Bangladeshi. Sometimes we had a one expatriate. We, we, uh, IDE as a total organization, uh, by the time I left, had 550 full-time staff. Uh, of those, maybe 13 were at the head office, all the rest were in the field, and were virtually all local people. And superb people, too. So now, a quick segue. Uh, I've got time for like one or two questions, and then I want to go into what's happening now. Yes. Oh, you were just scratching. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, were these treadle pumps installed on a per family basis, or more, did you see them being installed in a more community kind of? Uh, we looked at installing them on a community basis, uh, but uh, my experience with farmers and uh, IDE's experience is whenever you can with farmers, they're sort of as stubborn as I am, and they, they are not, often not very cooperative. So if you can dumb down a, a, or, or miniaturize a technology to single farm size, you're better off. Uh, there are many instances where you can't do that. For instance, uh, some village in Nepal whose water source is a stream, not, uh, you can't have every farmer 
running a pipe up to the, the stream if it's one kilometer away. So then you have to form a uh, water users group and share the water and so on. Uh, so that works. But what often is overlooked in my experience is the transaction cost of forming a group. So it, uh, for farmers, uh, I always try to design something for individual farms and then do uh, collective collectives or groups uh, uh, or cooperatives when that's not possible. Other, other, there are other organizations like CLUSA that uh, work from forming uh, cooperatives. The reason why it's because the cost might be an issue here, so most of the farmers might not be able to afford it on their own, but if they're doing it collectively, they might be able to. Yes, that's true. 25 bucks is a lot of money. However, if you combine that with the fact that it earns 100 bucks in one growing season, then the critical constraint is really credit. Uh, if, if, if it costs 25 bucks and you can reliably uh, pay it off three times in uh, 90 days, and that's the threshold that we're looking at, then with financing it works. And uh, there's a surprising number of sources of informal credit. Uh, farmers themselves have uh, often money because they have to for dowries and, and uh, important events. Uh, but they're very, very risk averse and conservative. So they're not going to spend the money until they're absolutely certain that there's no risk. So uh, the, the critical thing is 25 bucks is within the range. It's, it's, it's one month salary. And if it shows a 300% net return, then a lot of people can do it. But then, you, then one of the things, we never did come up with a satisfactory way of providing credit through the supply chain with large numbers, but that's the other thing. When you have that kind of return, you can do that. Yes? A lot of the micro lending micro credit that I hear about is targeted at women. Yeah. I, Statistics, or do you target mostly men or women or family units? Uh, yeah, the I think it's uh, Mohammed Yunus and and, and, and the other uh, groups uh, have had very good luck with women. Uh, I've seen some instances where that's sort of like with any loan thing, you you go through the hoops that you need to to get the loan and then then whoever it may be the man applying through the woman but by and large that's a very good way to do it uh, we work with uh, individual farms and there's a such when you go across countries there's such a cultural difference uh, that uh, but very often treadle pumps have been very important empowering tools for women you get women in uh, Bangladesh who have a drunk as a husband and they have not they they really have no power with with a treadle pump they have a source of income and they can tell the man to butt out or straighten up uh, there are women who uh, if a farmer who lives on a dollar a day has three dollars and one son he's not going to get dowries for all his daughters so they have to depend on the charity of one of their brothers often a treadle pump so there, there's a real gender thing about income generating tools, uh, a very, very powerful thing. Uh, one more and then uh, l let me get through some of this other stuff. Let me have one. Combining forces with the Grameen folks to do the financing of the travel pumps to get scale. Oh, uh, we didn't explore that, we just did it. So, so I mean, uh, uh, 15 years ago, uh, Grameen uh, Bank uh, sold 25,000 treadle pumps. We, we, we uh, partner with uh, a lot of different organizations. That's just the way things, things work a lot better that way. So the question really is, so, there, so what about the jealousy factor or crime in the rural places? So for example, if a person gets rich, you know, the other people like that go, it's a place like the part of India I come from, there's a lot of terrorism where extortion is a big problem. Yeah. So if you have a bunch of farmers who are getting successful, do you have jealous farmers or these terrorists who essentially get funds from these guys trying to make money? I'm not saying you have a solution for that, but is that something you've seen and have you thought about it? Yeah, there, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a rural village in Asia, it's, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog very often existence. And uh, there is no solution except that economic empowerment really tends to level the playing field. And I've seen many more instances where, you know, you have these water lords in rural India. They have a big well and then they are uh, masters of the fate of a lot of people who have to earn a living working for them. And uh, 
when they start to get treadle pumps, for instance, these small farmers now are much more self-sufficient. They do de don't depend on the water lord for their water, and they can negotiate uh, more equitable uh, wages. So I haven't seen any initiatives that are uniformly positive. Everything you do has positive and negative. Uh, the risk that you're talking about is one of the risks, of course. But uh, the issue is, does it on the, on, on, on the whole end up with more positive than negative, both in terms of environmental impacts, uh, justice things, empowerment, and so on? Uh, now, I've talked to hundreds and hundreds of people who have made use of, this, uh, of these various opportunities. I have no doubt that their lives are immeasurably better on balance, but there are lots of problems with it as well. Okay, let me talk now about uh, some of the opportunities that are, uh, I think, useful for big business. So, we have, Mohammed Yunus has a concept of uh, social business. That's a business that people, the investors get their money back. Uh, as Kentaro said, uh, the concept of creative capitalism uh, I resonate with that. Uh, however, I think that if social status is the, is the critical factor uh, for businesses doing it, I think that's only a niche population. In the end, I believe multinationals will only enter emerging markets seriously when you can demonstrate serious bottom line profits. Uh, and I think it's very feasible to do that. So 10 months ago, I said I started these two new companies. Windhorse International is the name of the for-profit. It's, it's, if successful, will be a multinational organization that will use the principles of slow technology uh, to make attractive profits serving the 2.6 billion customers who live on less than a do, uh, $2 a day. I think with a lot of discussion, the problem is that big business so far has not really felt that you can make money serving emerging markets. And uh, far too often, the way they try to uh, reach emerging markets is to make cosmetic changes in existing product line with the hopes that it'll sell. What, what is needed is nothing less than a revolution in how big business designs, prices, and markets its products. So the best way to talk about this is to give you an example, a couple of examples. There are a billion people in the world who don't have access to clean drinking water. One of the movements is water kiosks. Uh, water Health International has a water kiosk using ultraviolet to uh, kill the bugs in water. Uh, the cost of one of their kiosks is 35000 It's pretty much provided by a uh, total subsidy with the Indian government. Uh, they provide uh, something like 20 to 30,000 liters a day. There are water kiosks in Indonesia. Uh, the, the lowest price of a water kiosk that I've seen is 3,000 bucks. We've designed a water kiosk for the, the capital cost will be 300 bucks, and it'll produce 10,000 liters of water a day. The technology is a very simple one. It's used in big systems, and it is, this is, a, you can see the size of this thing. This is a little demonstrator, see the quarter. That's a little, uh, um, like a thumbnail uh, uh, water container with an electrode charged by a battery. And if you run a little bit of salt water, if you run electricity through a little bit of salt water, you get chlorine. Basically, salt is sodium chloride. It produces uh, uh, sodium hypochlorite, which has unstable chlorine, so you can chlorinate water. The problem is that existing, there's a company called Myox. It has an electrochlorinator. It's about five or 10,000 bucks is the smallest one. So we've dumped it down to a $50 electrochlorinator that'll produce uh, enough chlorine to 
sterilize 10,000 liters of water a day. And the business model is a micro franchise. We think the kiosk will cost around 300 bucks. Total franchise fee will be 1100 bucks, including a franchise fee to the uh, franchisee, uh, some money for marketing, and some ancillary services. <coughs> it's designed then to produce a 90 day payback on that 1100 bucks, income of 20, 20 bucks a day gross, uh, and $100 a, a month royalty to the parent company. Artist rendering is something like this. There's an electrochlorinator at the top. There's a couple of water vessels. Women come with their water containers and uh, pay a few pennies for water. What's your power source? Uh, you can uh, power that with a, uh, with a little solar system because it uses so, uh, it, it, it's far less electricity than any other method. Uh, so with another 20 bucks, if you don't have uh, electricity, you add a solar uh, recharge thing for your battery. That's about it. Now the other added benefit of this is you can sell bleach. Bleach is useful in, uh, uh, for, for little uh, bed and breakfast places. Uh, it's useful as a household cleaner. It's useful for hospitals, for sterilizing equipment. Uh, people who are selling food to tourists uh, uh, need to uh, process their, their lettuce so that uh, you don't get sick from it. So uh, we will uh, uh, package various versions of, uh, uh, of cleanser and that'll be a secondary item. As, as still a third item that uh, is for sale in places like India. A lot of you from India know this. During hot weather you uh, pay uh, 50 paisa for a glass of ice water and you often have no clue whether it's drinkable or not and the price for a glass of lemon water iced or fruit drink is two rupees so you're talking about five cents a cup so these water kiosks will also produce uh, ice water and flavored water I, I mean, we're even thinking of producing a decentralized form of Coca-Cola, which is a nutritious drink. Because a centralized model of soft drinks, you produce the product in a centralized location, then you spend a lot of money carting the fluid, which is heavy. If you have a decentralized source, now these kiosks are serve 200 families each. So if you have decentralized, clean water, pure water, and you can take the chlorine level down to whatever level you want with a charcoal filter. Then all you've got to do is add your magic formula and you can have a nutritious drink, which is a soft drink, sold locally at a good margin. But it requires thinking in local, really decentralized. Yes? I'm going to sound like I work for a multinational when I ask this question, but how do you work for a multinational? <laughs> yes. I, well, I work here at Microsoft. Well, then that's not a surprise. <laughs> My question is, how, how extensive or, or formal is your research process? You say you go out and you talk, to, talk with your customer. But from that to testing your, your business model, <coughs> how, how formalized have you, have you made this process? Because it sounds like you're very agile and enough, enough that you can develop businesses very quickly and get stuff on the ground? We're highly formalized in an informal sort of way. Uh, no, the model is actually fairly disciplined. For everything we do, we start with a proof of concept prototype and we go th run it through th thorough tests in the lab before we do anything. Then you go have a go-no-go -no -go decision. If you can't make it work in the lab, forget about it. If it works, then you have a beta test. So our beta test for, we're ready for beta tests for the water kiosks. We'll set up about seven water kiosks and run them for six or seven months before we do anything in a variety of settings. And uh, a lot of the problems are totally unpredictable and chaotic. That's true of any product, whether it's a multinational or a little pipsqueak 
a decentralized kiosk with a franchise fee of 1100 bucks. So we'll learn about the problem. This is what we've done with every one of our 13 affordable irrigation technologies. We'll learn from the beta tests. At the end of the beta test, we'll start the rollout process. If the beta tests are successful, if they're not, we torpedo the project. So that's what I mean. It, it is informally fairly formal. Yes? What's your time horizon in terms of from the time you started building prototypes till the time you've actually completed beta testing, you're ready to actually try a Oh, nine time. months. Nine months, but after, after I, I mean, here's, I, I've got a hundred horror stories, but we, we, we were doing treadle pumps in India in a saline area. And, and uh, since these were mild steel, they rusted out. It was a terrible problem. So they came up with an idea, a guy came up with an idea, putting a plastic sleeve that clearly is the solution. So we built a thousand of them and put them in the field and they rusted out very fast. Uh, after that embarrassment, I will never roll out anything until you put it in the field and test it. And, and that leads to unpredictable problems which usually are solvable. Yes, sir. Do we even need the multinationals or larger corporations to get into to solve the problem of Uber, Uber problem of solving poverty, can, or can it not be done through either grassroots, mo mo grassroots movements or, or entrepreneurs like yourself? I couldn't care less as long as it's big. Uh, the, the, the thing of it is that poverty is a big problem. Uh, most of the NGOs and so on are doing dribbling stuff, 20,000, 50,000. We did 17 million. That's a drop in the bucket. It needs a large-scale model. Uh, I am attracted to bringing multinationals into it because who knows about making money? Uh, poverty is an issue of making money. Who knows about making money better than multinationals? Multinationals, if it's profitable, can come in in the scale that's needed to make an impact. That's why I'm interested. If you can start from the grassroots and go up to uh, that scale, that's fine. But it takes longer. Uh, so I'm interested in attracting multinationals. Let me, let me show you this second model. Uh, can you hold it just for a second and, and, the, and then I'm done. Uh, and go back a step. The second issue is power. Uh, what's that? There's a billion people who, don't, who will never hook up to the grid is what they say. I don't know if that's right or wrong. Maybe 1.6 billion who aren't hooked up now. Uh, photovoltaics has always been very promising, but its, its actual performance has been ridiculously uh, trivial. Uh, the, all of the photovoltaic uh, systems that were installed in the world in 2005 amounted to less than one half of 1% of electricity usage in the United States. The reason is, while they have a lot of uh, attractive features, photovoltaics are too damn expensive. Uh, so the question is, uh, can you lower the cost? We've come up with a, what I think is a transformative, simple way of cutting the functional cost of photovoltaic generated energy from $4 a watt wholesale to $1 a watt. If you can reach a dollar watt, it's truly transformative. And the way of doing it is not that complicated. It basically starts with the realization that all the attempts now to lower the cost of uh, laying down layers uh, of silicon wafers, uh, that, that hasn't really dropped the cost enormously. A lot of people are saying that it will drop. It's a lot cheaper to focus sunlight on an existing solar panel than to lower the cost of the solar panel. So in the West, you have these, uh, the best way of doing that is, uh, is a parabolic mirror. Those things are expensive. They end up getting, having bells and whistles, and they track the sun and do all kinds of things. So in the end, uh, they lower the cost a little bit, but not enough to make a big difference. In a village with serving 200 families, there's a simple way of doing this. And here is the prototype that went to a buck and a half a watt right out of the chute. Looks very complicated, doesn't it? This is what I mean by slow technology. What it is, we started off with an inflatable pillow with uh, some people raised 25 million bucks. It's got a plastic window and a mylar reflector. We couldn't get the pillow miniaturized, so 
Kurt Kuhlman, my partner in crime, who is able to make anything out of anything, uh, took a piece of plywood and put it in the shape of a J shape, like a cross section of an airplane wing, glued some mylar on it, and uh, that uh, uh, concentrates the sunlight right here. So you hang a solar strip there, and you get 12 times as much sunlight. It heats a bit. You may have to cool it. You have to follow the sun. You uh, will do that with a pulley system and move it three times a day by hand. With a little voltmeter, you move it till a voltmeter reach, reaches the highest point. This is what it'll look like, something like that. Now you've got a 200 watt solar system with a black box that you can hook up uh, cell phones to or charge batteries uh, uh, and a little shed to store it in. 200 watts for five hours is, uh, is 1,000 watt hours. The days of uh, lines to houses are long gone, just like lines, telephone lines. So the future is in a small motorcycle battery in a house wired to two LED, one watt LED units. Uh, if, uh, if you run those for four hours, two rooms, uh, and that's about, I think the en energy intensity you need for light is about three times a kerosene lamp. I, I get that from talking to people. Uh, that's uh, eight watt hours. That's 125 people you can supply with this system. Uh, it again will cost 1100 bucks. The most lucrative thing you can do is charge cell phones. In, in rural sub-Saharan Africa, you pay 30 to 50 cents to charge a cell phone. You have the potential with this system of charging 125 cell phones a day. That would be 60 bucks on a, on a total investment for the franchise fee and everything of 1100 bucks. You'll never charge uh, that many cell phones in one area because they're scattered and there are not that many of them. Uh, but you put a battery on a bicycle or a motorbike and you have a mobile charging system. You make a deal uh, with a cell phone company and you do uh, text message marketing, which says if, you have, if you'd like to get the low cost uh, uh, cell phone charging service uh, in your remote area, please call. Uh, the central, so you send out 500,000 of those messages. Thankfully, they all go to cell phone users, which is called target targeting your audience, uh, then you direct them to the micro-utility in your area. The micro-utility will keep paying the franchise fee because you're doing the, a, a very important marketing service. Uh, then uh, the uh, micro-utility also pumps water, runs a little uh, arc welder, uh, processes grain, uh, and maybe runs a little movie theater at night. Uh, easy, I think, to make 20 bucks a day, 600 bucks a month gross, 350 net. Uh, you see what I'm saying? And uh, then again, $100 royalty. But each of these, now you've got 100,000 micro utility franchises and 100,000 uh, water kiosks. And you, you repeat this with other areas. I haven't mentioned a lot of the others that are potential. Um, you now have a private sector supply chain that can sell LED lights, batteries, $50 solar home systems. So you get another source of revenue and you become the supplier. You see what I'm saying? Now this, this is the future of business for the huge numbers of people that are now not served. And uh, I can't speak to this audience without mentioning that what's needed in the information technology field is something more in the price range of 12 bucks that uh, produces some important income generating functions. And uh, Kentaro and I are working on it. Uh, I think I'll stop there. DREV as a nonprofit is, is uh, fomenting a design revolution. We've, we've got uh, courses teaching students who want to learn to make a difference in places like uh, Stanford, Caltech, and MIT. Now we've got an initiative to do that in 100 universities around the world, including uh, 
uh, 50 in developing countries. Uh, we're also uh, doing several, we're acting as a technology incubator, uh, especially for those technologies like the treadle pump that you'll never make profit in an international company, but it's profitable for local enterprise. Uh, so um, here's some examples. This is a student from MIT operating a sprinkler system in Myanmar. Uh, these students go to the village, they form multidisciplinary teams, they come up with a business plan uh, and a kick-ass technology at the end, a lot of them. There's one group called D-Light that uh, raised two or three million bucks. Uh, this is uh, a, a, what I'd call a slow technology water storage system in Myanmar. It's basically a modified wading pool, it costs seven bucks when a cyclone hit. That We sent out thousands of those to areas that didn't have drinking water. You add a bit of chlorine to that, and you've got yourself drinking water in a disaster area. Totally unanticipated. This is a, a, another group at Stanford that came up with uh, uh, Embrace, a company called Embrace. It's a $25 uh, premature infant incubator. The key issue with a premature infant is keeping it warm. Incubators cost eight to 10 grand. In remote rural areas, there's no electricity. They just took a sleeping bag. You take a phase change material like you, get in a, like you put in your ice chest. You put it in the freezer, only this is a phase change material that you can put a container of hot water against. And you put that in the sleeping bag and it'll keep the infant warm for uh, four hours. When, the, when, the, when you need to recharge it, the mother holds the infant against her skin. Uh, it takes 15 minutes to recharge it. They formed a, this company, Embrace. They've, they got 125 grand in prizes. They formed a company there in India now, making that company work. So as far as I'm concerned, the next step in ending poverty is getting big business to enter this field because it's a virgin market opportunity and a profit opportunity. So I'll stop there. How are we on time? We're good. We have, we've done another, I'd say let's do Q&A. Obviously go on for a while. Maybe another 10 minutes of Q&A. Yeah, is that okay with everybody? Or yeah. what, what, who has to, whoever has to and, leave, and just so leave. Everyone knows the slide will be available um, and also contact information. To you I have to run, but I want to shake your hand. Well, thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Here's, uh, by the way, contact information. If you, if uh, I'll leave that up if, if you... Uh, uh, need to get in touch uh, and want more information. Yes? Can we send out the slides, please? Sure, and I've got another slide deck which you can uh, get, uh, which gives more detail about uh, the past 25 years. Any other questions? Well, I'll go here. Sure. She can go first. Okay. okay. Yes. Um, it's from the presentation and there are solutions that have I think the, uh, the question is, are the, is the agriculture interest industry the, the main one that uh, big business can get into? Uh, I think that uh, uh, there are huge opportunities across the board in health. There's a whole uh, growing movement to create uh, micro-franchise health centers on a for-profit basis, for instance. Uh, energy, you name it, there are th thousands of opportunities. Agriculture is just one. Some of the irrigation devices, uh, you know, when you r really analyze drip irrigation, in, uh, from my perspective, it's a commodity business. It's plastics. Not enough margin in it to be attractive to a multinational. But as a piece of a package that sells seeds. You know, it's, it's a question of the, doing a business strategy. You can sell packages to small farmers that are very attractive and are profitable. But the irrigation technology may not be the way to do it because the, the margins are not attractive enough. So there, there are many different opportunities. Yes? You were a judge for Microsoft's Imagine Cup contest last year. Right. right. Well, you know, I, uh, some, some of the people here know that I, I made some suggestions about improving the likelihood that coming out of that, uh, pro projects will be commercialized. 
And uh, the, my suggestions are not surprising in light of what I've said today. I said, look, uh, make a requirement in, in the judgment, judging criteria that you talk to at least 25 customers before you start. That you write a really good business plan that is persuasive, that you have a communications package, and that you work in multidisciplinary teams. I thought it was amazing that uh, something like 210,000 people were competing. Uh, that's a real opportunity uh, to, uh, but, but, but the, the opportunity that I saw is to increase the probability that a big proportion of the people coming up with things, whether they win prizes or not, are commercialized. But to do that, you have to tilt it towards designing for the market, not just designing for the technology. Now, I'm not saying that, that there are some superb technologies there. I enjoyed it very much. Yes? What kind of financing is available for people who want to experiment in this space or try business about it? Is there venture financing available? Well, there's a whole, uh, the question is what kind of financing is available. There's a whole social venture network. There's social venture uh, financing available for some of these things. Uh, a lot of the teams at Stanford have raised a fair amount of money on, uh, on their projects. Uh, uh, so there is some funding available, but it's a virgin field. Um, there are many prizes, so a lot of the student teams that come up with these things that compete for prizes and win prizes. But still, it's a fairly low percentage that either some of the students uh, have uh, other jobs, uh, some of them don't want to follow on, but increasingly students are coming up with stuff that really works. So there is social venture capital available, uh, and I think this is a virgin field that will grow. Uh, what kind of groups are, what kind of social venture funds are available? Well, there's a thing called the Social Venture Network, as an example, meets once a year. These are people who have made a lot of money who want to invest, not just in giving things away, but in, th in businesses that will uh, uh, make a difference. Terry Molnar is a guy who... Yeah, 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 there are a lot of different... Uh, yeah, there, there's a large number of them, and people in this room would, will, can tell you a lot of the names. Yes? Well, um, thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I had two questions. The first was, do you think that uh, having been a trained psychiatrist helps in uh, talking to customers, and, and, and are, there, are there skills that you think uh, others should acquire to do that? And the second question was, uh, I actually found your presentation uh, very analogous to some of the ideas that Mark Gandhi had about how to how to lift people out of poverty in India. Mm -hmm. Mahatma oh, yeah, sure. sure. Of so course. Go, simple, cheap, and, yeah. and, and I wanted to ask you, was he a personal inspiration for you as well, or not? Or, or uh, were you inspired by Well, I liked his threads. That's one thing. <laughs> his threads. Uh, uh, no, I'm just being the usual smart ass. Uh, sure. Uh, I, th I think some of some of some of the th his concepts are exactly the same. Uh, only at that time, he he was a master. You know, before before public relations were invented, he was a genius at it. So he chose things that that moved millions of people the walk to the sea and to make your own salt water and knit your own clothes. But, but a lot of those concepts are exactly the same. The other question uh, was, uh, does uh, being a psychiatrist help? Yes and no. I mean, I happen to know a lot of psychiatrists and I think to some extent, but, but many psychiatrists don't listen to their patients either, you know. Uh, one of the things that I did early on as a psychiatrist is listen to people who were acutely psychotic being hospitalized and I asked them what their view of the process and listened to what they had to say and that revolutionized the way we worked with these patients and that was adopted around the world. The psychiatry helps but the kind of listening skills that I'm talking about are fairly common in a lot of professions. You take a master salesperson, 
that person knows how to listen. You, you can't sell nothing if you're, if you're, I mean, this whole thing about selling uh, uh, refrigerators to Eskimos, you've got to understand the customer to close the sale, right? And, and people who are good at it listen. So there are lots of uh, sharp business people listen. There are a lot of people who listen, but there are a whole army of people who don't. Uh, and uh, uh, the people who can listen are not confined to psychiatrists. And there are some psychiatrists who are superb at that and others who aren't so good. Same as any, in any other field. Have, have you like, given a talk just about sort of your process for listening and walking through people the way in which you... No, you but increasingly that becomes uh, the, uh, I'm, uh, the next books. By, but I'm always torn between writing a book or doing stuff. And I always come down on doing stuff. I wrote this book because at this point needed to have a book in order to, uh, to help create the revolution. And, uh, but if I, there were other books, one of the books is designed for the other 90%, talking about the design process. One of the books is simply on listening. Because I think that's a thing that comes up again and again and again. What do you mean by listening? How can you listen when you don't know their language? Well, because the words is only 5% of the communication. Uh, so, th yeah, the listening is really important. Uh, maybe, maybe a talk on listening would be, uh, would be useful if anybody would listen to it. <laughs> yes? I wonder if you, may, uh, you are thinking about the intellectual property and, and how it crosses with, with this. Because you mentioned, for example, healthcare, etc. I used to work in, in a pharmaceutical company in Argentina, and one of the big issues was the intellectual property. And even though they they were able to develop very cheap medicines for the poor. For the poor, uh, they infringe uh, intellectual property for big pharmaceutical companies in, in the big countries. So the problem was they they shut down markets and they had to focus on markets like uh, the other markets like China, etc. All the developing countries. So the thing is how how. You mentioned, okay, okay, you mentioned, for example, the, to make this available as a business model for for the big companies, right? The multinational. How how it deal with, with the intellectual property? Yeah. Well, okay. So intellectual. But there are many constraints, and I don't mean to uh, present this as a as a slam dunk deal. There are just as many problems, and in a virgin market. You've got bigger risks, but you've got bigger rewards. One of the issues is intellectual property. In Bangladesh, for instance, one uh, fairly reliable indicator of whether you had a good product or not is that the good products were ripped off within two weeks. Uh, there is no intellectual property uh, protection uh, unless you're a huge company. Uh, but there are strategies. For instance, uh, if you can hit the market with big volume, if you have an effective branding strategy, if you have some things that uh, uh, are not easy to rip off, all of those things. So there are strategies uh, uh, that, that actually act as replacements for the formal intellectual property that uh, we have here. I think there are strategies that you can use in other situations. So for instance, with treadle pumps, we made them freely available to anybody. We encourage people to steal the technology. So there are different intellectual property strategies for different products. How could you do that and make a buck? Well, we didn't make a buck. We did it as a nonprofit. We decided that uh, there wasn't enough margin in treadle pumps to make a buck. So, what are you thinking? Oh, well, uh, just, just what I was saying. Uh, well, number one. We've already uh, started the patent process for the concentrator, uh, but uh, uh, so that we'll have the patent process, but what good will that be in India? I don't know. Uh, it may slow things down. The really better patent protection is the business model, the, uh, the uh, branding, uh, going big fast, uh, the capital that's required to compete. Big companies don't agree, <laughs> so the point is sometimes, well, they... Well, well, you see, I know the big companies don't agree, and the big companies don't feel that emerging markets are a profitable area to make money. 
And I've tried negotiating with Netafim, I failed. I tried negotiating with Jane, I failed. Uh, that's why I'm going to go to it. If I can demonstrate profitability, then we can talk. So I want to form a company that demonstrates you can make attractive profits. Maybe one more question, because I know you have to go to an interview shortly. So sure. One more question. Yes. We didn't talk about um, just about how much of government is a hindrance or a help, or a lot of what we do necessary. We engage governments now. I mean, obviously, your model doesn't really suggest that, but. Governments. The question is about governments. How do you work with governments? And, and the thing of it is that as a nonprofit, we basically in each country, now we work in a lot of areas, IDE, that are considered not good areas to work. Like we've been very successful in Myanmar, less successful in Zimbabwe, but we got a program there. We've been in Myanmar for five years. Uh, that program has been selling more than 10,000 treadle pumps a year through the private sector uh, and, 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 and working fairly well. We generally, as a nonprofit, get le legitimate status as a social welfare agency, whatever it takes, as a private company. Uh, and then we go low profile, straight to the village, and work directly with the villagers. Uh, I happen to think that uh, one of the reasons that current poverty programs don't work is that uh, uh, 80 percent or more of development assistance is multilateral or bilateral. It runs through governments. It's intellectually uh, an attractive model, but it simply has failed. Uh, I think that we need to reverse that ratio, put 80 percent directly to the village, to any individual or organization that can demonstrate uh, measurable impacts and scalability and cut the funding to anybody who doesn't. Uh, so I think that uh, there are problems in working with governments in developing countries, but we've found a way of working fairly well. Uh, the program in India, IDE's program is now an autonomous organization with an Indian board. It's gotten sizable enough that it really does deal with the government. So you have to, you have to develop ways, and, and uh, f from that, uh, 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 we've worked in, in, in Maoist villages in Nepal during the whole of the so-called Maoist uprising. The Maoists now won the election. Uh, but there are ways of learning how to do that so that you can, uh, we worked in those Maoist villages fairly successfully through the whole period. Sometimes uh, without, uh, some Maoist leaders uh, took our technology to other villages. Some tried to block us, but uh, the Nepali staff had such a p strong tie to the women who were making money in the village that uh, we were in. I mean, but it meant getting in at the right time, moving very quickly, demonstrating a, a, a huge jump in income quickly, and once the women were behind it, that was it. You, you know what I mean? So that uh, the, there are different ways to work, and I can't in, in, a, in a short talk talk about the whole thing. But governments, uh, we work, there are ways to work with governments. But it's very, it, it, in the places that are the poorest, uh, the UN says we won't work with in, in these areas officially except for, for uh, humanitarian assistance. That I think is a travesty because very often the greatest proportional poverty is in the areas where the governments are really bad. So you've got to find ways to work there, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you.